Good morning. It is so good to see all of you today. And uh, hopefully, if they're not seeing us yet at home, they're going to see us in just a moment. Uh, but technology, you know. <laughs> one week it's your friend and one week it's your foe. And uh, right now, it's uh, trying to be a little bit of a foe, but we're uh, working on that. So uh, if you're at home and you're not seeing us, uh, you're not going to hear me say this, but please don't give up uh, on us. We'll, we'll get there in a minute. So uh, anyway, we are, we are glad that you're here today uh, to join us for worship in this place. Uh, we do have a few announcements, some things that we need to share with you as we get started today. And uh, first of all, just a reminder to the ladies of Lafayette, uh, you need to be sure that you're planning on participating with us in a virtual craft with them in a virtual craft fellowship on Sunday, uh, March the 28th from 2 to 4 p.m. Uh, it's going to be on Zoom. It should be Saturday. Okay. Yeah. It should be Saturday. The 27th, Saturday the 27th, I don't know. Okay, I think I corrected it last time upstairs and not in the other, you know, okay, you don't need to know that. Be on the lookout for communication, but it is Saturday, March 27th from 2 to 4. And uh, we wanted to be sure you saw some samples of some things that uh, you can make. This is a burlap canvas uh, on a uh, cut-out wooden thing for it to hold it taut. They're in the lobby if you want to take a look at them up close uh, there. But these are uh, the images of those. And, uh, and there are instruction sheets about that and uh, what you would need to have on hand to be prepared to do the, uh, the craft fellowship. And uh, you can get those, those from uh, Faith and, and uh, from us in the lobby back here uh, after the service or come by the church office and get one this week if you need to pick one up. Uh, we would be glad to get that in your hands and hope that you'll plan on being a part of that. I want to remind you that Holy Week, we have a number of things that we'll be sharing together during that week uh, to try and help us focus on uh, the meaning and, and uh, the remembrances of that week. Our Palm Sunday celebration will be next Sunday, and we need some Palm videos. If there are some children that would like to do some Palm videos and record those and send those to us uh, via email, uh, we encourage you to uh, get your children and do that. Uh, you can either find your own palms to use if you've got uh, access to any of that, or if you want to pick up one from the church, it's a craft uh, thing that you can put together and you can use that and record those videos. We need those uh, as early as we can get them, uh, preferably uh, to by noon tomorrow. If you can get those to us, we've got to edit together that video. We're going to do use that in worship as well as have the children that are here with us in person uh, doing a, a, a Palm Sunday uh, parade of palms uh, here in the church. Uh, then on Monday, Thursday, we are going to be having a worship experience in communion here in the uh, worship center. It will be on April 1st, obviously, that Thursday, from 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock p.m. And you will come anytime during that time uh, to participate in that. There will be a meditative uh, experience that you'll be a part of. Uh, Dr. Jorgensen is helping us uh, prepare that, and it will help you engage uh, with the elements of, of what happened, uh, really from Jesus' baptism all the way through uh, the, the uh, time uh, that Jesus is with his disciples in the upper room uh, on Maundy Thursday. And then uh, our Easter Sunday celebration will be on that Sunday, April the 4th, and we look forward to uh, celebrating and sharing that time with you that day. And then I uh, just want to give you a reminder that our pastor is uh, leading us on uh, Tuesday nights in a Lenten Bible study uh, entitled The Way, and that is on Zoom at 7 o'clock p.m. Uh, we would be glad to share with you the link if you're not getting that already. Uh, we would be glad to get that to you so that you can share that time with us on Tuesday nights. We're together about an hour uh, from 7 o'clock to about 8 o'clock, and it's a, a great time as we think about the way, the way that Christ uh, has called us to by examining uh, different parts of his life and ministry uh, here. 
And then uh, just a meeting reminder for the Music and Worship Search Committee. Uh, they are meeting today at 2 o'clock p.m. in the multipurpose room. Be sure and bring your mask, and we will be distanced uh, together in, in the room that day or today, uh, and we look forward to sharing uh, that time. And then one other thing before Kevin comes and extends uh, his welcome and uh, shares our invocation and opening prayer, uh, I want to tell you about a special guest that we have with us today. We have Kara Smith with us today. Kara, raise your hand. Kind of. Kara's right here on the front. You need to clap. You need to clap whether you know what she's doing or not. She is here as a guest, and she is uh, going to be our pianist uh, for the next little while uh, sharing with us. She is uh, a teacher at the Snyder Music Academy and then also has a teaching responsibility up in Cameron, you said, is that right? And uh, she and her husband are here. Uh, they came here from Texas. Uh, and when I say that, you go like, I bet he's military. You would be right. Uh, and uh, they, they are um, uh, with us here in Feville, and we're excited uh, to get to know them and to share this time with them and uh, for Kara to come and use her gifts here. Uh, she obviously, being connected with the Snyder Music Academy, uh, knows uh, Joy Cogswell real well, and Joy put us in touch with her, and she was willing to come and share, and we are so excited uh, to have her with us and for her uh, leadership in this way. It, we are very excited to have you here, Kara. All right, well, these are the things that I have for you. I'm going to go check on some technology. Hopefully it's working. If it's not, I'm going to try and figure it out. Okay. <clears throat> well, I too want to say welcome, and it's good to see you all here in person, and we're thankful to have Kara with us this morning. Good to have you online if you're worshiping with us online today. Uh, as we come together, we're in this season of Lent, and it calls us to focus on our relationship with Christ. And so uh, this week I was uh, coming over to the office, and I heard a song on the radio. Uh, it's uh, New Today by a person named Micah Tyler. And so I'm going to use some lyrics from his song as our opening invocation. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord, we've been tough on ourselves lately. Every morning we feel the weight when it's hard to just get out of bed. And it's hard to tell our hearts because sometimes we forget that your mercies are new today. Your mercies are new today. We can rest on your shoulders. There is grace to start over. Your mercies are new today. Your mercies are new today. Help us rise like the morning sun. Help us see that your works are not done when we are less than what we want to be. Lord, we need you to keep reminding us your mercies are new today. Your mercies are new today. We can rest on your shoulders. There is grace to start over, for your mercies are new today. And for that, we say thanks, O God. Be with us in this moment of worship. May we sense your spirit right here in our midst. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from John chapter 12, verses 20 through 33. Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, 
and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this hour, for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by, by what death he would die. With this time of Lent, we focus on our relationship with Christ. And part of that is coming together and acknowledging that we don't always get it right. We have a lot of work to, to do on our side of the relationship from Christ. And so at this moment, we will pray together a prayer confession. I ask you to follow me with the words on the screen where it is in, emboldened and says all or everyone. Let us pray for the cleansing of our hearts, confessing our sins to the one whose mercy is everlasting. Redeeming God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole hearts and have not loved our neighbors as we ought. We have strayed from your commandments. Do not remember our sins but forgive our iniquities that we may fix our eyes on you and sin no more through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We have confessed together how we need to work on our hearts and in that we trust that Jesus is with us along the way. And so there's forgiveness and grace and mercy that comes through Jesus Christ. We acknowledge that with our declaration of forgiveness. So sisters and brothers, by the faith of Christ, our sins are forgiven. May we delight in the joy of our salvation. Thanks be to God. Good morning, children of Lafayette. It's nice to see you this morning. Can I tell you something about me that you might not remember or you may never have known? When I was working my way through divinity school, training to be a, a pastor and eventually a, a professor, when I was working my way through that, I worked as an elementary school teacher. It is the truth. Now, because I wasn't a, a traditionally trained elementary school teacher, I was quite creative in my methods. And, and also my duties shifted from year to year, depending on what needed to be done. And, and, and so uh, one year when the second and gra uh, third grade team teachers, one who did reading and, and, and writing, and the other one did math and science, they both had babies at the exact same time. So myself and one other took over for them at the, at the half year mark. And so I became a second grade homeroom teacher teaching reading and writing. And I loved every minute of it. It was so great. But I did things a little differently than some others because I liked to use the imagination. Do you like to use your imagination? 
Oh, me too. So I think you can I think you can follow along with me this morning, okay? Because sometimes when we would line up from recess to go back to the classroom, I would do things a little different way. I'd say, line up, and we'd all line up, and everybody would get in line. I'd make sure everybody's listening and everybody's ready to go back. And, and when I would line up and I would ask if we were ready to go back, I, I would say things differently. Instead of just saying, let's go, I would say, shall we? And the students in unison would say, we shall. Isn't that a fancy way to say it? Sometimes it helps to be a little fancy. So can, can I be fancy this morning? Can, can we put on our imagining caps? Now, I brought a little bit of a costume, but for the kids who do not have a costume with you, just use your imagination. So here we go. I'm going to be fancy. All right, here we go. will start with a fancy, I don't have an ascot, but I'll put on a fancy scarf. Okay, here we go. Am I looking fancy so far? Thank you. And a fancy coat. <laughs> Very fancy indeed. Sometimes you need to use your imagination. So, children. <laughs> my monocle's misbehaving. Children. Shall we? Ah, oh, yes. Shall we use some fancy? Mm -mm. Shall we use some fancy words? Indubitably. This worked much better in rehearsal. Yes, yes. Would you like a spot of tea? Indubitably, I would. Yes, thank you. That's very nice. You're, you're doing great. Wonderful imagination. See, here's the thing. I like fancy phrases. And the verse that we heard read today has one of my favorite fancy phrases in all of the Bible. You see, in an old translation of the Bible called the King James Version, it was translated 400 years ago. They use all kinds of fancy words. And when the people, when the Greek people wanted to see Jesus, they went up to the disciples and said, can I use my fancy voice? Here it is. They said, sir. We would see Jesus. Isn't that a fancy way to put it? Sir, we would see Jesus. And, and, and that, I think, is a nice way to say we would like to see Jesus. I have actually seen that verse pop up in some strange places. Can I show you where? In some older churches, right on top of the pulpit, right where the pastor can see it and not anybody else. There's a little reminder to the pastor, sir, we would like to see Jesus. So in other words, dear sir, dear pastor, we aren't interested in you being extra super smart or extra super funny or extra super anything. We just really, really want to see Jesus. Does that make some sense? Now think about that. Do you think that folks in the world, the people we meet, the people we love, do you think they want to see Jesus too? Maybe that's a good word, not only for the preacher in the pulpit, but for all of us to get that people want and need to see Jesus. Whether or not we are being fancy, people need to see Jesus. You know, I, I think that there are two ways that we can see that, right? The one piece is people need to see Jesus in us. But there's another piece of it, too. We need to see Jesus ourselves, don't we? So my prayer for all of us, whether you are one of the children of Lafayette Baptist Church, who might like to be fancy every now and again, or whether you are one of the grown-ups who are also listening to this children's sermon. 
May we show people Jesus in our lives, but may we also see Jesus more fully and more truly ourselves. And I have a feeling Dr. Kevin might have something to say about that too. Amen? Amen. Pray with me. Lord, we thank you that you have chosen to show yourself to us. Let us see you again. We need it. We want it. And Lord, once we see you, may other people see you in us as well. That's our prayer. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I'm a product of the 90s. I can remember going to school on Friday mornings, either in the back seat of my family's car or in the back seat of my friend's car. Yes, back then, carpooling was a thing to do, going to school, and singing to myself the theme song for the ABC Network's TGIF. Does anybody remember that, the TGIF on ABC? It was certainly something to look forward to after my dad got home from work that day and with a large pepperoni pizza from the Pizza Hut. You know, that was also the thing to do in the 90s, go to the Pizza Hut. And my family would all just gather around the wooden console TV in our living room and sit there and eat pizza, literally turning the knob to Channel 11, ABC. We had our fair share of deep belly laughs from Steve Urkel on Family Matters, and somewhere in there was step by step. But then I think it was right in the middle was Full House. I remember all the cutesy lines from the Olsen twins from they were little back then, and the funny sayings from the three uncles who lived in the same San Francisco house on that steep hill. I always wondered how in the world do so many people live inside that one house? The one line I remember from the show was an Uncle Jesse trademark. Somebody would say something totally unbelievable, and Uncle Jesse would slick back that jet black rock and roller hair and bellow out, have mercy. In our eyes, there's nothing wrong at all for people saying, we wish to see Jesus. Sir, we would see Jesus. That's something, something we would want to see more of, wouldn't we? It might just be an answer to some of our prayers, folks running up, wishing to see Jesus or hear more about Jesus or know everything there is to know about Jesus. But we hear this group of folks trying to see Jesus are Greeks. And back then, people who were Greeks and people who were Jews didn't associate with one another. So no wonder we hear this chain of conversation take place among the disciples. The Greeks tell Philip first. Now, I'm sure it had to feel like when you're shopping at a big box store and you're looking for something and you see an associate and you say, can you help me find something? And they say, hold on, wait a minute. And then they go off and you hope that they come back. I can just see Philip throw his hands in his pockets and say, uh... You just wait right there. And then he takes off to go see Andrew. And Philip finds Andrew and says, Hey man, there's these folks who want to see Jesus, but they're Greeks. So Andrew throws his hands in his pockets and says, Uh, wait a minute. 
I'll go tell Peter. And so Andrew takes off and tells Peter. And Peter throws his hands in his pockets and says, Well, I should have known it be me who gets to tell him. And off Peter goes to tell Jesus, Lord, have mercy. That's just the thing about this whole ordeal. Peter tells Jesus, and Jesus turns the news about a group of people looking for him into a big sermon about seeds and seeds dying and seeds producing more fruit. All this ends with the very words from God. I mean, it's all well and good. Surely these words written in red should mean much to us today. But here's my question. Did these folks, these Greeks, even get to see Jesus? I'd like to hope that they did. I'd like to hope these folks found the same compassion from Jesus as is shared with Lazarus and his family earlier on in John chapter 12. I'd like to think they saw Jesus. I'd like to think they saw Jesus explain that now his time had come to be glorified. The time had come for them too to know God's ultimate love for everybody. No matter what outside qualifiers are present, no matter what label gets slapped on somebody as a one-and-done stereotype of a deal, Lord, have mercy. You know this parable Jesus shares, the one here about the wheat seed falling off the plant and going into the dark, cold ground and dying, it really catches our fancy. We, we know what it's like to harvest plants for single use. You know, think about all those seeds that are in that slice of tomato that we put on the sandwich and how those seeds could, could potentially grow into new plants. Or think about all the spuds that would have spun off that one delicious baked potato on your plate. The fact of the matter is we do not think in these terms. We focus on the individual singular use of so many different items. Eventually this turns into singular thinking about ourselves that has a tendency to result in a hyper-driven sense of entitlement that squashes any room for transformation through the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. This week I was reading back through the book, The Heart of Christianity by Marcus Borg. It was gifted to me several years ago by a very dear friend of mine, the late Kevin Lofton. He was one who tried to see Jesus and others and through himself. And in the book, Marcus Borg says this, we acquire a sense of who we are from our socialization and our ongoing life, from the relationships and focus that shaped and continue to shape us. These include relationships with family and friends and the effects of school and work and perhaps church and also the impact of the wider culture in which we live. Culture has a powerful effect on us. Our culture bombards us with messages that shape our sense of who we are and what is worth valuing. In the United States, the central values of our culture are the three A's, as Marcus Borg says it, attractiveness, achievement, and affluence. Thus, no matter how good our parenting was, we grow up wounded. That's scary for us to hear who are parents, grandparents, great-grandparents. Our socialization and life and culture confer conflicting and conflicted identities. Not only are we not whole, but many of us have a low, sometimes desperately low, sense of self-worth. 
And as a result, all of us need the formation of a new identity. I have a strong inclination, these three A's that Marcus Borg speaks of here, attractiveness, achievement, affluence, are things these Greeks may be facing when they tell the disciples they wish to see Jesus. They know what it's like to live within a culture that's focused on moving up the ladder by any means possible. Primarily speaking, primarily speaking, many New Testament scholars think people moved up the social ladder back then by publicly humiliating your so-called opponent in a blame and shame game, a literal means of stealing one supposedly higher placement in society by questioning the integrity of their character out in public. Attractiveness, achievement, and affluence are all wrapped up into this blaming and shaming. It's no different than what we see in celebrity feuds that take up way too much airspace today. It's in the same realm of reality TV stars leaving behind a legacy that is detrimental to the way young people, young teenagers may view themselves wanting what small handfuls of people say is best versus seeing what they find in the mirror as a human being who's made in the image of God. Lord, have mercy. It's time we all take a closer look within, not in yet another self-aggrandizement gaze, but to really see and observe what is found within our hearts. I think we've really got to make our starting point of seeing ourselves and each other as human beings, not human doings, all created in the image of God. You know, it's quite interesting, Jesus talking about that seed falling into the ground and dying of itself. As I've strived to learn more about starting my own garden seeds, my own vegetables by seed, as I've shared with some of you, I've noticed so many people think you need to give that seed everything you've got, the most water the very best soil, the most expensive soil you can buy, and as much fertilizer as you can throw at that thing to make sure it does what it needs to do. Well, guess what? Do you realize that all that seed needs to germinate into a new plant is contained within that thin seed coat? All it needs is just a little bit of moisture. All that seed needs is contained right within it, within the DNA present to form hundreds and hundreds of new seeds to repopulate the plants for the next year. It's found inside that thin outer skin. It just needs, like I said, a little bit of moisture and the right temperature to emerge as a seedling. New growth. New possibilities, new life. Even though the seed turns into something completely different, a new plant, the possibilities through this transformation are quite unlimited. Marcus Bohr goes on to say this, the formation of Christian identity will thus also always involve a transformation of identity from an identity given by the world to an identity in God, in Christ. Christian identity formation involves the deepest level of ourself, the heart. It addresses what is perhaps our deepest psychological wound, our sense of not being enough. Addressing this deep sense of identity, this lack of self-worth, is basic to Christian identity formation. It's what makes us Christian. 
Indeed, it is the most basic message to the gospel. And to express it in familiar words is simple. You are created by God. You are a child of God. You are beloved by God. You are accepted by God. Now let me say that again in case you missed it the first time. You are a child of God. You are created by God. You are beloved by God. And you are accepted by God. I want you to repeat after me. I am created by God. I am a child of God. I am beloved by God. I am accepted by God. Amen. It's time for mercy. Would you pray with me? God, if we are all honest with ourselves, we do struggle with the sense of enough. We struggle with the sense of self-worth. We struggle with the sense of identity, who we are, who you've made us to be who it is you're calling us to be. And so, God, we look to you. We look to Christ. We are no different than these Greeks who say, we wish to see Jesus. For we too wish to see Jesus. So God, maybe the starting point is to realize who we are through you. For you have created us, you have loved us through Christ, and you accept us for who we are. You give us mercy when we didn't even deserve it. You give us love that's unimaginable. You give us unbounded and unbelievable grace. So Lord, today, help us to focus on the heart of the matter, our hearts. Help us to come to the place of accepting your mercy on all of us, not just us here, not just those watching online, but all, even all outside these walls. To see and to accept your mercy that comes through Christ's sacrifice on the cross, the suffering and dying on our sake, and to know that it is through that mercy that we find our hope. For our hope is in Christ who is resurrected from the grave. Our hope is in the one who changes our hearts. Our hope is in you who transforms our lives. So God, be with us today. Be with us on this journey called Lent. Easter is only two Sundays away. Help us to get to that point at a better place than where we are even today. Be with us. Guide us, oh God. Help us to be reassured of your mercy and of your grace. 
For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We come to this time of commitment in our worship. And I want you to know, first, that God loves you. God loves us all. God loves those who are not here this morning. If there's anything that you're struggling with, take this time and pray with God. If you feel like you need someone to talk with, talk with me or Steve after the service. Give us a call this week. If you want to be a part of this community of faith, this faith family, come see me or Steve and we'll talk about how to make that happen. Know that you are loved and know that God grants his mercy on all. There's nothing that gets in the way. The only thing that holds us back is ourselves. So accept God's mercy, for he accepts us as we are, coming to him, searching for mercy and grace. Please stand and join us for our time of commitment as we sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
Again, I want to thank you, my brothers and sisters, for coming this morning to worship. I hope that in coming here today, you've been lifted up. I hope that coming here today, you know God loves you through Christ. He gave his life for you to have the abundant life, both here and something to look forward to in eternity. And I want you to know God calls us to walk out these doors seeing Christ not only in our hearts, but seeing Christ in others too. So as we go forth from here, may we pray together. Jesus says, whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. So may God, whose hand has written the law of love upon your heart, Fill you with peace from deep within, through mercy that is never deserved, and with mercy that never ends. May we go forth from this holy place, committed to live in harmony. May the blessing of God, the one who loves, forgives, and calls us home, be with you now and always. So go in peace and serve Christ Jesus. Amen.